In addition to honoring the 215th anniversary of the duel tonight, there's another very special anniversary this year, and that is the 250th anniversary of the birth of Dr. David Hasek in 2019. And Although he is best known today for his role in the Hamilton Bird Duel, as, as the Hamilton musical calls it, the doctor with deniability, he has so much more that he has given to this nation. And I hope that after tonight, you'll be in awe of the complete picture of his life uh, as brought to incredible vision by Dr. Victoria Johnson in her book, uh, American Eden, David Hasek, Botany and Medicine in the Garden of the Early Republic. And so I first picked up this book early last year, right after it came out, because I recognized the name and I wanted to learn a little bit more about him, and I figured there would be some Hamilton connections there. But I must tell you that I came away with just the most incredible breadth of vision of the time period that Dr. Hasek lived in, what he contributed, and this is truly one of the best history books I've ever read. And so this book has rightfully been awarded as a finalist for the 2019 Pulitzer Prize in History, a finalist for the 2018 National Book Award in Nonfiction, a finalist for the 2018 Los Angeles Times Book Prize in Biography, the Colonial Days of America 2019 Book Award, amongst many other well-deserved recognition. Dr. Johnson is also a former Coleman, Coleman Fellow at the New York Public Library and is currently an Associate Professor of Urban Policy and Planning at Hunter College in New York City. I hope you all enjoy this time with Dr. David Hossack this evening and please welcome Dr. Victoria Johnson. Thank you. Hello everyone. Um, all right. Um, so I normally give my talk with slides, and I'm going to try to be so exciting that you don't need the pictures. <laughs> you do have the backdrop of Manhattan, which is not the normal backdrop for my talks. Um, I've been giving this talk around the United States, and uh, I just got back from a book tour to the United Kingdom, uh, where Husek had, David Husek had studied in Great Britain, and I went to some of the sites where he had studied and got to share his story. There, um, I am thrilled to be uh, speaking with this backdrop of Manhattan in this city. It is such an honor to be here, especially in David Husek's 250th birth year. His birthday is August 31st, um, and I'll say a little bit more in my remarks today about why I think he deserves to be remembered and not just as the doctor with deniability. <laughs> I'd like to thank everyone who made it possible for me to be here tonight and to thank you all for coming. Um, I tweeted right before the event that uh, some of my friends and family joked that I should row over from Manhattan. <laughs> and I you know, thought that was irreverent and I rolled my eyes and um, it turned out um, uh, my nephew is here with me tonight, and um, it did take us an hour and a half to go three blocks in Manhattan. So I tweeted that it, in fact, would have been faster to row here tonight. <laughs> and now I'd like to take you back to Manhattan in September 1797. A young doctor is rushing down a New York City street to the bedside of a 15-year-old boy. The doctor's name was David Huzzock. He was just 28 years old. He entered a townhouse at number 26 Broadway, and he was shown to a bedroom where he found the boy in the grip of a terrible fever, likely typhus or scarlet fever. Huzzock saw that the boy was delirious and then unconscious and then delirious again. He sent the boy's distraught mother out of the room so she wouldn't have to watch her son die. And he dispatched a courier to bring the boy's father back from a business trip to Connecticut. Huzzock later said that he was certain that the boy would be dead before dawn. Now he knew that his more experienced colleagues would try to bring the fever down with cold cloths pressed to the skin, but that hadn't helped the boy. So instead, he chose heat. He drew a steaming bath and he mixed a botanical remedy into the water, Peruvian bark, which is made from the cinchona tree native to the Andes. Next, he sprinkled in smelling salts 
Then he lowered the boy's limp body into the bath and waited. Within minutes, the boy's pulse quickened and he began to regain his senses. Hazek repeated the treatment and they swaddled the boy in warm blankets, carried him to a bed where he slept deeply for several hours before awaking past all danger. Now Hazek was worried that something might happen to the boy. So he didn't leave the house, but he permitted himself to doze in a nearby bedroom after the hours of anxious effort. Suddenly, he bolted awake to find the boy's father kneeling at his bedside. It was Alexander Hamilton. Taking Huzzick's hand with tears in his eyes, Hamilton thanked Huzzick for saving the life of his precious eldest son, Philip. And in that moment, Huzzick became the trusted friend and advisor to one of the nation's most famous and powerful men. But his medical intuition that night did more than forge a bond between a founding father and a young physician. It moved Huzzick one step closer to an idea he had quietly been nursing for three years. After the night he saved Philip Hamilton's life with the help of a medicinal plant, Huzzick spent all of his energies and a million dollars in today's money, all out of his own pocket, launching the nation's first public botanical garden. Now why a botanical garden? Many of us think of a botanical garden today as above all a beautiful place to spend a day or attend a wedding, and they are that. But they do much more than that. And Huzzick too was driven by a more urgent mission. All around him, Adults and children were dying of diseases whose causes no one fully understood. Typhus, scarlet fever, yellow fever, cancer, consumption, apoplexy, diabetes, gout, liver disease, and on and on. Many people around Huzzick didn't understand what he was trying to do. And some even mocked him publicly. They didn't realize that in an age when most of the medicines known to doctors came from plants, an American botanical research institution was a critical source of new medicines. Well, Huzzick had recently studied as a young man in Great Britain, and there he had discovered that for doctors and medical professors and medical students, botanical gardens served as classrooms, pharmacies, encyclopedias and textbooks all rolled into one. And he also learned that no one really understood just what made a particular plant effective against a given illness. He caught fire with a passion to help change the situation, especially in the young United States. He had studied at Columbia College when he was a young man. It had recently been renamed Everybody in here knows what it had been called, King's College. And he studied in the 1780s at, King, at Columbia College. And then he studied in Philadelphia with the great physician Benjamin Rush. And it wasn't until he got to Great Britain that he realized truly how important botanical gardens were. So when he returned to New York in 1794 as a man in his 20s. He was appointed immediately a professor of botany and pharmacology at Columbia on the strength of this cutting edge medical education in Europe. Huzzick uh, joked that he, when he was in Europe, he, he went to Europe because he had realized as a young doctor in the United States that even though Americans were very proud of their institutions, they liked their doctors to come with European credentials. So he went to get this advanced medical education in Europe and he set up his medical practice back in New York and began teaching at Columbia. Now at that time, you mainly got paid by ticket sales to your students. So we still have a lot of the course tickets that the students bought to Huzzick's classes. You had to be a very charismatic lecturer to get a good salary. So Huzzick worked very hard when he was in, in uh, Edinburgh and London. He took notes on which of his professors were boring and so that he wouldn't do that. And then he took notes in church on Sunday, which uh, preacher was boring, so that he wouldn't do that. And he was wildly successful. When he came back to Columbia, he began drawing lots of students to his classes. And one of his students wrote home to his own parents about Huzzick's obstetrics lectures that 
when, quote, Professor Huzzick undertakes to please, he is as good as the theater. Now, if there are any professors in the room or former students, you know that this is an excellent teaching evaluation to get. Well, Huzzick enchanted his students. He, he was so charismatic. He waved his arms around. He had this big black head of hair and big bushy eyebrows. And his students said in their notes that Huzzick even used his eyebrows for emphasis in his lectures. Um, and he told them, he insisted that the United States deserved doctors just as skilled and knowledgeable as Europe's, but he found it so frustrating that he had no botanical garden to teach them in. So he began lobbying Columbia trustees and his colleagues and the state of New York for the money he needed to buy land and build greenhouses and hire gardeners and collect plants from all over the world to found this research institution. It was around now, 1797, that he saved Philip Hamilton's life with the help of a medicinal plant, and he worked that scene into his lectures. Because what could be more inspiring to a classroom full of teenage boys studying medicine, and they were all boys, what could be more inspiring than the idea that with your craft, you could save the life of one of the heroes of the American Revolution? Huzzick finally gave up on his colleagues and went ahead and founded the Botanical Garden on his own. He bought 20 acres of land, three and a half miles north of New York City in 1801. He took a country lane three and a half miles out of the city to get to this beautiful piece of property, which is directly behind me across the Hudson. It is hard to imagine that it was covered with mountain laurel, viburnum, violets, had rolling hills, grand old oak trees. Huzzick began to create his research institution, his botanical garden. He collected plants from all over the world, from the likes of Thomas Jefferson, the scientist Alexander von Humboldt, the scientist Sir Joseph Banks, Napoleon's botanist sent him plants. He was in touch with everyone he could think of. And gradually, he amassed a collection so astonishing of plants from around the world and from the farms and fields next door. He collected in Manhattan, he collected on the beaches below Weehawken, he collected in the fields around the tiny town of Brooklyn. And all of these plants came to about 30, uh, 3,000 species. And when I shown his plant lists to the botanists at the New York Botanical Garden, one of the greatest gardens in the world, they, these botanists literally shook their heads in amazement at what this man had accomplished on his own, with his own money, his own initiative at the dawn of the 19th century for the good of his fellow citizens. Well, as Huzzick was working on his garden, he began to become famous. And it's hard to imagine today that if we accept the politicians, Huzzick was one of the most famous Americans in the entire nation because of his work on the garden. He had portraits painted of him, busts sculpted of him, commemorative coins cast in his honor, including the one I'm wearing around my neck right now in his honor. It was struck during his lifetime. He received praise from Jefferson, from Madison, from Humboldt, from Tocqueville, Napoleon's botanist came to study with him at the Botanical Garden, which he named the Elgin Botanic Garden after his Scottish father's hometown of Elgin, Scotland. Well, Huzzick became so famous that when he suffered a stroke in 1835 at the age of 66, newspapers from New Hampshire to North Carolina ran bulletins about his condition and offered prayers for his recovery. Now, how many people have heard David Huzzick's name? We have. <laughs> there are more in this room than there usually are. But it's really hard to get our brains around the fact that he was so famous in his day. He wasn't just famous for the garden. Huzzick was a member of the post-revolutionary generation. So he was younger than Hamilton and Burr and their peers. Now imagine you're a teenage boy in the 1780s in Manhattan, crossing paths in this small city with 
the heroes of the American Revolution. Your elders have brought a new nation into being. If you're a member of that generation, those teenage boys, what do you aspire to do? What can heroism possibly look like to you? Well, for Husek and his peers, the answer was to found the civic institutions that would put the United States, that fragile young democracy, on a firm footing and possibly bring it respect in the eyes of haughty Europe. When Husek was in Great Britain, he wrote back to Benjamin Rush, his mentor, the British have been surprisingly warm to me, even though I'm from the United States, a member of their erstwhile foes. He said they've been surprisingly warm, but they are waiting for the American experiment to fail. And Husek came home determined to help put his nation on a firm footing in the arts, sciences, medicine, and every arena he could touch. In addition to founding the Elgin Botanic Garden, Husek founded or co-founded the New York Historical Society, the city's first museum of natural history, its first museum of fine arts, its first obstetrics hospital, its first public schools, its first school for the deaf, its first mental hospital, its first subsidized pharmacy for the poor, and more institutions besides. Husek began with his botanical garden but he ended by helping make New York, New York, the nation's greatest city for the arts and sciences in an age when Philadelphia was the undisputed crown jewel. As, Hamilton, as Husek worked on his garden, he began to draw the praise of eminent Americans, including his friend and patient, Alexander Hamilton. Husek was serving as the physician to the Hamilton family on the strength of his performance that night in the Hamilton home when he saved Philip's life. Husek began to draw this acclaim and he also drew Hamilton's attention to the Elgin Botanic Garden. Husek helped Hamilton with the design for the Grange, for the grounds of the Grange. Hamilton considered himself a terrible horticulturist. He said, uh, he wrote to a, another friend as he was laying out the grounds of the Grange that horticulture is a pastime, quote, for which I am as little fitted as Jefferson is to guide the helm of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> well, fortunately, his friend and physician, David Husick, was the nation's greatest Linnaean botanist. He was the best trained botanist in European botany. And he had a botanical garden conveniently located at the halfway point between Hamilton's townhouse and his country house, The Grange. And Hamilton sometimes stopped and got plant cuttings and horticultural advice from his expert botanist friend, Husek. There's a sketch of a garden, an ornamental bed that Hamilton did for Eliza that was uh, a, a beautiful circular garden that included li li lilies and hyacinths and tulips, and it was reportedly modeled on a sketch on a bed that Husek had at the Elgin Botanic Garden. But Husek wasn't only Hamilton's friend and physician. He was also Aaron Burr's. He was taking care of Burr, who was widowed by this point, and Burr's daughter, Theodosia. So when Burr and Hamilton became embroiled in the war of written words that culminated in the duel, David Husick was the logical choice to be the attending physician. So on July 11th, early in the morning, Husek joined Nathaniel Pendleton, Hamilton's friend and second, at Hamilton's house on Cedar Street. Husek knew Pendleton well. Husek had saved the life of Pendleton's son when the baby was one week old, not long after he saved the life of Philip Hamilton. So when Husick stepped into the boat at the edge of the Hudson with Hamilton and Hamilton second, he was responsible for saving the life of 
both their children. As many of you in this room will know, Hazek had also been present at the bedside when Eliza and Alexander watched Philip die of a gunshot wound after fighting a duel defending his father's honor. There was nothing Huzzik could do. So when Huzzik stepped into that boat, he knew that he was risking participating in an event that would bring agony to Eliza. They were rowed across the Hudson, and when they reached the beautiful beach beneath Weehawken on the spectacular Palisades, this was a river that European visitors wrote over and over about. They had never seen anything so spectacular as the cliffs of the Palisades over the mighty Hudson River. And they pulled up on the beach below Weehawken in the boat. Hamilton and Pendleton got out and went into the underbrush to meet Burr and Burr's second Van Ness on the dueling ground located higher up the hillside. They left Huzzik on the beach below. I try to imagine what Huzzik saw and felt on that spectacular summer morning. He was a botanist. He had a botanical garden straight across the Hudson on the hill in front of him. He was on a beach swathed in green with salt marsh cordgrass growing around him, Dutchman's pipe draped in the trees on the hillside. And as he waited in this beautiful scene, he didn't know which of his admired friends he would be called to find wounded or dead. He waited, and within minutes he heard a shot, and then he heard another shot, and then he heard someone shouting his name, and he raced up the hillside. <coughs> and what he saw there, he later said, he would never forget until the end of his own life. He saw Hamilton lying half cradled in Pendleton's arms on the ground, gravely wounded. Huzzik approached Hamilton, who said to him, this is a mortal wound, doctor, and fainted dead away. Huzzik tried in vain to find a pulse. He couldn't feel a heartbeat when he laid his hand over Hamilton's heart. Hamilton seemed not to be breathing. Huzzik and Pendleton got Hamilton down to the boat and the oarsmen helped them put Hamilton in. They laid him in the bottom of the boat. And as Huzzik recalled the scene, as they were rowed back, it was 50 yards into the river before Hamilton revived. Huzzik had been trying everything. He knew that he couldn't remove the bullet. It was too deeply lodged. He waved smelling salts under Hamilton's nose to no avail. Finally, he poured them directly into Hamilton's mouth. And if you've ever experienced smelling salts, you know that it is searing and painful. Hamilton revived, began breathing, and began speaking. He told Huzzik that he couldn't feel anything in his legs and his feet. And he told Huzzik that he knew he would soon be dead. They were rowed to the New York side of the Hudson and Hamilton was carried in great pain into the house of William Baird. And Huzzik began his vigil. He knew there was nothing he could do and he watched helplessly as Hamilton's family and friends began to gather He tried to alleviate Hamilton's pain, but he knew he couldn't save him. And Hamilton died the next day at two o'clock in the afternoon with Huzzik and family and friends at his bedside. Huzzik was devastated by Hamilton's death. This was one of the people he admired most in the world. But he had to hold his grief in check because he was asked by Hamilton's family 
and friends to perform the autopsy. Can you imagine? He cut into his friend's abdomen. He felt a mass of clotted blood under his fingers. And beneath that, he could feel the little spikes of shattered bone of Hamilton's spine. You would think that someone who admired this man so much would then reject and revile the man who killed him. Huzzock spent the next decades honoring Hamilton's legacy. He was instrumental in establishing the monument, the original monument at the dual site with the St. Andrews Society. He had a portrait of Huzzock, of Hamilton, in his house by the painter John Trumbull. He had a bust of Hamilton in his townhouse, in his drawing room, when he died in 1835. He participated in the committee that erected a sculpture of Hamilton in the Merchants Exchange Building. Everything Huzzock did honored Hamilton's legacy. But he stayed close with Aaron Burr for the rest of their lives. And when I followed Huzzock's behavior, his life after the duel, when I first realized that he stayed close with Burr, I admit to being troubled. I couldn't understand how you could be loyal and loving to one man and loyal and loving to the man who killed him. Many of you will be familiar with the work of the eminent historian Joanne Freeman, who taught us so much about the meaning and rituals of duels. And it was in part with the help of her research that I realized that Huzzock was one of those who understood that this was above all a political ritual. Huzzock lived by a principle of strict neutrality when it came to his patients and to the pursuit of science and civic life. Huzzock wrote a friend, quote, science knows not party politics. It's very striking to our ears today. He lived so firmly by this principle that his best friend, DeWitt Clinton, who he met in college and stayed close with until Clinton's death, has it completely disagreed with Clinton's policies and they were best friends. Huzzock stayed close with Aaron Burr, so close that when Burr fled to Europe after yet more political scandal, Huzzock's younger brother, William, went as Burr's traveling companion. And Burr left Huzzock in charge of Theodosius' care. Theodosia was deathly ill in New York City while Burr was in Europe. Huzzock was one of the people from, from time to time, Burr would write to Huzzock and say, please advise me on the suitability of my coming home. I found this astonishing until I understood how devoted Huzzock was to the idea of a greater good, of shared civic life that transcends party politics. Late in Huzzock's life, he was asked by friends to run for political office. He had never done this, but he had founded all these institutions and everybody could see that he was incredibly gifted at organizing other people. He declined, and I wanna read you the quote with which he declined. He said, until there's a political party devoted to the great passions of my life, education, the natural environment, civic improvement. He said, quote, to such a party, I could not hesitate to avow my allegiance, but under the existing dissensions, I must decline and devote myself to the cultivation of the vine and fig tree as more conducive to my own happiness and that of my family. Now, 
Huzzick's family life remained intertwined with people from both sides of the Burr-Hamilton conflict. His son, Nathaniel Pendleton Huzzick, named for Hamilton second at the duel, his son Nathaniel Pendleton Huzzick married a granddaughter of Angelica Schuyler Church in 1831, Sophia Harrison Church. Huzzick died in 1835 after overexerting himself during a fire that devastated much of Lower Manhattan. And in that same fire, the statue of Alexander Hamilton that Huzzick had tried to, had helped erect in the Merchants Exchange Building was shattered. When the roof fell in of the Merchants Exchange. Now, Aaron Burr died about nine months after Huzzick. Huzzick couldn't be there at his deathbed. It fell to Huzzick's son, Alexander Huzzick, who was a doctor, to care for Burr in his last days. And Alexander reportedly asked Burr before he died, do you regret having killed Hamilton? And Burr's response, reportedly, was, no sir, I could not regret it. Twice he crossed my path. He brought it on himself. After Huzzick's death, the American writer Freeman Hunt reflected on a what, what it meant to lose this famous American, David Huzzick. He said, quote, as a physician and man of science, his name was universally honored as the first as a citizen, the many virtues and excellences of character have made a deep impression on the hearts of thousands. Huzzick's death, Hunt wrote, had left a blank in the scientific and social world. So why have we forgotten a man so celebrated by his contemporaries, a man who did so much in the early years of our nation? I think the answer is this. We like our heroes to stand alone so we can see them and celebrate them. We like them to have accomplished one very visible thing, whether it's being a, an incredibly effective politician or finding one cure to one illness. Now, Huzzick did something much harder to see, something I think is incredibly important and worth celebrating. He showed his fellow citizens over and over how to build civic institutions. This is difficult work. There are so many people in this room who do this work every day, who wrangle volunteers or who volunteer, who write bylaws, who go to annual meetings, fundraise, all of these things that are so important to the, our civic life together. Huzzick did this with every fiber of his being for decades until his death. Today, in this age of, to use Huzzick's term, existing dissensions politically, I think it's apt and important I feel passionate about celebrating a man who tried to rise above the political fray and work together with his fellow citizens across the political spectrum to nurture these institutions that make our cities so humane and livable. So as you've heard, Huzzick's 250th birthday falls next month. And I believe that now is the time to recognize Huzzick's place in the history of our city and our nation, not only to celebrate his contributions, but to honor those of the thousands and thousands and thousands of Americans who every day do that critical work of nurturing our civic institutions. Thank you. Thank you.